this is a near perfect 4% grade. How do I know that? What does that mean? Well, stay tuned and put on your thinking caps because that's the topic for today's Workbench Wednesday. Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio on a Workbench Wednesday. Hope you are having a great day wherever you are and whenever you happen to be watching this. So today I want to talk about grades. And no, I'm not talking about the kind of grades you get in school. I'm talking about the grades that a railroad uses to get from a lower elevation to a higher elevation, how they climb from point A to point B. Understanding how grades work will really save you a lot of time and grief if you're starting out planning a new layout or adding to an existing one. I see a lot of people that come into the hobby and they're really excited and they might you know set up some track on a table maybe they do an over and under figure eight which is a very popular style of track plan and then when they go to run their train it doesn't climb the grade very well or maybe not at all and then they get frustrated. Well this is because they probably didn't calculate the grade correctly or even bother to calculate it at all. They just, you know, looked at how much room they needed for one train to pass under another and, you know, looped the track up to that point. There is a little bit more to it than that. Now, it might seem odd for me to be talking about grades because there are no grades to speak of on the Thunder Mesa Mining Company Model Railroad. That was a design choice based on the desire to have smooth running during a display mode when people are coming to see the layout. But moving forward with the redesign of the layout, I am going to be adding some grades here and there. So I thought this would be a good time for a discussion of this topic, and we can talk about how grades function on a model railroad. There is going to be some middle school level math here today, so please bear with me. Usually a grade is expressed as a percentage. Um, say you have a run of 100 feet and you want the track to rise 4 feet by the end of that 100 feet. Well, 4 feet is 4% of 100 feet, so that would be expressed as a 4% grade. And yes, I will be speaking in imperial units today because that's the way my brain works, but if you come from the civilized, metric, scientific part of the world, uh, just translate things into meters and centimeters. The math is all the same, only the units being measured are going to change. To return to our example from the top of the show and bring all of this into the model making world, we can say that a rise of 4 inches in 100 inches is also a 4% grade. It really doesn't matter what the unit of measurement is. If you have 100 of them and you rise by 4 of them by the end of that run, that's a 4% grade. That's the way percentages work. I'm using a 4% grade as an example here because it's so common in small model railroad track plans that you see in all the old books and magazines. And I think that's probably because it's, it's pretty easy to break it all down and also because that was about the maximum that uh, most equipment could handle reliably. But if we're talking about, say, a 3% grade, then it's only 3 inches of rise in a 100-inch run. If it's a 2% grade, it's 2 inches of rise in a 100-inch run, and so on. But you get the idea. So how do we break all that down and make it useful? Well, if you take that 100-inch long run and divide by 4, then you get 4 25-inch long runs. So every 25 inches, the track elevates 1 inch. That's a really handy thing to know and remember when you're designing model railroad track plans. One inch of elevation rise for every 25 inches, at least with a 4% grade. And that is exactly what I have right here. This piece of HO scale track is 25 inches long. This eraser just happens to be one inch high. So when I place one end of the track here on the tabletop and the other end on this eraser, I have created a 4% grade. Easy, right? Now let's apply those ideas to a simple track plan. Say I want to create a track in ON30 that comes and loops back over itself at a higher elevation. This is actually a very practical engineering solution. You take a short, steep climb and turn it into a longer, 
more manageable climb by having the track go around and loop back over itself. You know, you can take a look at the Georgetown Loop Railroad in Colorado for a great and dramatic example of this. But say I only have a space that's like 42 by 72 inches to get all of this done. That means I'll be needing some 18 inch radius curves and very likely a 4% grade to get up and over. That's both steep and sharp. But here's the thing, the entire run doesn't need to be 4%, just parts of it. Starting out at a zero elevation here below the bridge, we measure along the track 25 inches, just like our example over on the desk, and that will bring us to our one inch mark. Now when we measure the next 25 inches, we start to get into a curve, so now what? Here's the thing about sharp curves. Your train actually has less traction on a, on a sharp curve than it does on a straight, and that's because there's less surface of the locomotive wheels making contact with the rails, so therefore less traction. And that means it's going to be working even harder to get around that curve. Now put that curve on a grade and suddenly the effect is multiplied your manageable 4% grade has become much, much steeper from the locomotive's point of view anyway. The solution to this is to make the grade less steep on the curves. And in our example, I've simply cut the grade in half from 4% to a more manageable 2% on the curve sections. So instead of counting one inch at a time along the track to get to 25 inches, I count two inches on the curves effectively cutting the steepness of the grade in half. And that will put our two inch elevation mark right about here. Continuing on around the curve and doing the same thing again, our three inch elevation mark goes right about here. And now I've switched back to a 4% grade for the straightaway and 2% again at the start of the next curve. And that will put four inches right about here. Now there are, of course, sophisticated track planning apps that can figure all of this out for you, but I think it's important to know and understand the old school way of doing it too, just by counting inches along the track. Now continuing along at 2%, because we're on a curve, we end up at 5 inches of elevation by the time we get to the bridge. Just enough clearance for most ON30 equipment. But don't forget to account for any parts of the bridge that are below track level and might create clearance issues. So there we have a very simple up and over with a 4% grade on the straight sections and 2% on the curves. But this gives us a ruling grade of 4%. The term ruling grade simply refers to the steepest section of a grade on a run. Well, now that we have conquered the loop, let's try something a little bit more complicated. Say I've got a section that's, you know, two feet deep by eight feet long, and I want the track to rise from zero elevation to six inches. That's quite an ask in that amount of space. Six inches higher, that's a scale 24 feet in O scale. How do we accomplish this? Well, fortunately, there is another 19th century uh, engineering solution that solves this problem rather elegantly. Of course, I'm talking about switchbacks. Instead of a loop that comes around and crosses over itself, the track switches back over more or less straight sections, breaking up a long straight climb into smaller, more manageable chunks. This was a popular engineering solution in the 19th century for logging lines and mining railroads and other short lines. Uh, you didn't see it very often on you know, big class one railroads. The Santa Fe wasn't going through any switchbacks, but you will find great examples on the Sierra Railroad at the uh, Angels Camp Branch and uh, on the old uh, Red Mountain area, the Corkscrew Gulch area out in Colorado. So now let's go back to the drawing board and figure out just how to do that on a model railroad. Here we have an eight foot long section with a set of switchbacks going up to a mine. This is an ON30 plan and it will give us just enough room for a locomotive and a few ore cars to clear the turnouts on the switchback tails and make the climb. For simplicity, each straight run on the switchbacks is 25 inches from turnout to turnout. With a 4% grade and starting back here at zero elevation, we can use this 50 inch long run to gain the first two inches. Clearing the turnout with the entire train, the engineer then throws the Johnson bar and we go into reverse, backing up the first switchback. Note that the track elevation remains level and consistent on the switchback tails from the turnout to the end of the track. Only the switchback runs themselves are on the grade. 
Again, we rise one inch over 25 inches and are already at the three inch elevation mark when we clear the next turnout. Throwing the turnout and then we proceed forward, climbing the next leg up to the four inch elevation mark and pulling the train all the way into the switchback tail again. Throw that switch, reverse again, and then we back our train up to the five inch switchback tail. Forward one more time and we climb another inch higher to arrive at the mine, six inches or 24 scale feet higher than where we started. Now, just for fun, here's the same example using a 3% grade. Now we climb just 3 quarters of an inch for every 25 inches traveled, winding up 4.5 inches higher than where we started. Then with a 2% grade, we climb just one half an inch for every 25 inch long run. Much easier on the equipment, but only arriving at half the height of the 4% example. There are many factors to keep in mind when planning for grades on model railroads, including the kind of equipment you want to run, how long the trains are going to be, any clearance issues that might pop up with uh, overhead track, bridges, things like that. Obviously, uh, geared power, geared locomotives like Shays and Heislers are going to do better on steep grades than small rod locomotives. And, you know, of course, diesels, that's a whole other can of worms altogether. If you're just starting out in all of this, and even if you're an old hand at it, I hope you found this information useful, and I hope you'll experiment with the motive power, the locomotives you have, to find out just what kind of grades that they can handle. One word of caution, though. Be as precise as you can in your calculations. Sometimes, you know, slop creeps in. You might get a little lazy. You might want to round things off. Because, you know, 24 inches is real close to 25 inches. It's very easy to visualize and remember two feet. But, um, you know, that small difference adds up over time and could substantially alter your plan. And it could really make the difference between making the grade or not. Thank you all so much for watching today. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell to see more from Thunder Mesa Studio. You can also follow us over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see what's happening on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. As always, a huge shout out and thank you to our Patreon supporters and members for making these videos possible. Couldn't do it without you guys. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.